and uh, he is my favorite language imperialist. <laughs> okay, so that's just joking. Uh, but uh, I, I think he's going to tell us. Is the favorite part of the joke? <laughs> no, it's a joke. He's going to tell us about the beginning of it. And uh, should I give the Churchill quote? Oh, sure. Yeah. You're going to spoil so, my you're going to spoil my okay, punchline. No, no, do, I'll do say it at the end. No, no, okay, great. <laughs> Are you going to say it at the end or the beginning? Yeah. <laughs> oh, the beginning of it. All right. All right. Hi, everybody. Let me start my clock here so I have some time. Um, today I'm going to give my perspective on where NLP is going in the age of large language models. Like, is this an ending or some kind of new beginning? I'm going to start this story way, way back and vastly oversimplify. Um, I'm going to oversimplify everything. This starts about 70 years ago, like just a few years after the transistor was invented and people started thinking about having machines do things that you know, people require require intelligence. And so maybe we could start this in like 1950 with uh, Turing's imitation game, or maybe in 1955 when McCarthy turn, coined this term artificial intelligence that we've all been sort of living with ever since, for better or for worse. And so there's this box called artificial intelligence, and it's really broad. It contains all kinds of things. But what's really in this box? Um, this box has been kind of hard to pin down, more because of the I than because of the A. It's been hard to pin down what's intelligence. So, you know, like maybe finding square roots shouldn't be in this box, not because it's not hard for humans, but, you know, it's really easy for computers. So in this box is really things that are easy for humans, but hard for machines. So a classic example would be something like chess, right? This is something that seems to require a lot of intelligence in humans, and at least for a while, it seemed really hard for machines. But AI can be this incredibly self-eating concept, right? Because if you take something like chess, and it's clearly a great example of artificial intelligence because we just can't solve it or go, but then once systems are good enough that they're exceeding human capacity, we have this way of looking at it and saying, you know what? Actually, maybe chess is like very configurational. It's like this logic puzzle. Maybe it's the kind of thing that computers should be good at. Maybe humans, surprising humans can do as well as they can. So maybe it's not really such a core example of AI anymore. So I just want us all to be on the lookout for cases where once we solve something, suddenly we decide that's not AI, that's not intelligence. That's just, uh, as Alyosha would say, a bunch of correlations. Um, so anyway, so what's in this box? It's very broad. It can taste things like natural language or uh, vision, robotics, and so on. And, um, and it seems like the one thing we can agree about in this box is it's very broad. So Sanjeev talked about there being lots of skills and any task involving tuples of skills. So this is like combinatorially broad as a box. So anyway, really broad, back to the 50s. People had this broad box and they wanted a broad solution for it. And a cartoon of the time is that people thought, well, at least some people maybe thought that everything could run on some kind of uniform substrate. Like maybe that would be first order logic and executed on a system like say a prolog uh, kind of environment. And all right, so all kinds of things did not fit into this frame, things that we would consider artificial intelligence now, work in image processing, work in speech recognition, and so on. But for at least a large chunk of things that people were interested in, um, there was this dream of doing it in a uniform way. Um, like, for example, uh, in Prolog uh, with first order logic. And that could be done maybe by one community with one set of techniques. Um, and maybe you could send all your papers to one place. Like whatever you did, if it was AI, it could go to AAAI or HKI or something like that. So there was this hope of a uniform approach. Now, there was a problem, which is that nothing whatsoever worked. But it did so uniformly, right? <laughs> all right. So um, this is where the story starts to get interesting for me because I am an NLP person. So I do NLP, and this is where NLP shows up into the movie. Um, and broad techniques turned out not to work. And if you approached every problem with just some simple logical deduction rules, then you either didn't get deep enough into the real problems to solve them, or maybe all of your rules started to conflict with each other in some way that wasn't very robust. In any case, what happened in practice is we got stuck in blocks world. And in order to make progress beyond this, you needed to specialize. And what you happened is people specialized into verticals, like my favorite vertical, natural language processing. Um, natural language processing started to look very different from the rest of AI, right? It wasn't just write some stuff down in first order logic. We started to think about things like context-free grammars. We had algorithms that were specialized, for example, 
uh, dynamic programs like CKY for doing inference over those. When we start to get to, get to data sets, we needed data sets for those particular representations, machine learning algorithms for those kinds of combinatorial structures. And this all got very specialized in a way that was different from other areas. For example, Vision had their own. Well, NLP was thinking about um, trees and co-reference resolution. Uh, people in Vision were thinking about edge detection or object detection, and were using techniques that looked, you know, more like things resting on linear algebra and so on. And you know, this sort of replicated across all of AI. Each vertical worked on its problems, its representations, its algorithms. And in order, um, in order to actually make progress here, you actually ended up going quite deep. So maybe I should actually draw it like this, because each sub area did end up going very deep into their own domains and their own representations. So let's zoom in on NLP. Okay, so what really made these verticals? What made them different from all the rest? Why were we not trying to have some uniform solution for AI anymore? And if we zoom in on NLP, um, we can think about it's really because we needed better representations to get anything to work. And if you think about it now, the NLP representations are probably going to look very different from the ones in robotics or uh, computer vision. So. Um, this raised a problem. What are the representations exactly? And it turned out there was another field that was thinking exactly this question about language. And this was linguistics. And the closest piece of that was computational linguistics. And so NLP became very closely aligned with computational linguistics because step one to making all of the NLP applications we care about work was essentially solve computational linguistics. So for step one of doing NLP, we first had to do CL. And that meant that these two fields were brought into very close alignment. Of course, people had different goals, and I'm vastly oversimplifying, but there was a lot of overlap. Um, and this same phenomenon of AI being too broad and different representations in vision versus language, this replicated within each of the domains. So for example, in natural language processing, we have subfields. These are verticals within verticals. So parsing people had context-free grammars and algorithms like CKY, data like the pen tree bank, and so on. Co-reference resolution is about finding partitions and linkages under various kinds of linguistic or empirical constraints and so on. And in general, the story was that NLP was super hard and we had to get the representations <laughs> right. And so again, we were very aligned with computational linguistics. This is going to be important for later. Step one of NLP is do computational linguistics. All right, the road led through computational linguistics because that's where the representations were. And by the way, this was very real. So this is a caricature, but it's not that much of a caricature. So uh, I dug up the program from ACL 2013, and you can see that the tracks in the conferences are basically isomorphic to uh, this decomposition I've given you. Um, OK, I, I made the colors match. That was on me. But the fact that there's the syntax track where they're doing all the syntax things, and then there's the semantics track where they're doing the semantics things, and so on. And each one is using different techniques, different subsets of researchers, and so on. It's a fragmented world. All right. So. There's a piece I left out of that says really important, and that is that people were definitely interested in doing things that were broad and things that were cross-cutting. Some of that was approaches to data. Some of that was approaches to, to statistical learning. And in fact, on that, one of the tracks was a machine learning track. One of the things that people really, really wanted was the ability to have some kind of portable general knowledge. So this has been a longstanding goal in NLP since like forever. So as soon as people had computational methods, one of the first things people were doing was clustering words um, decades and decades ago. And one of the things that people thought you might be able to do with word clusters, even back before word to vac right, far before, like in the 80s, people had basically reasonable word clusters, brown clusters in the 90s. And one of the things we thought is, well, independent of all this other stuff, if we're going to be parsing these sentences and finding their syntactic structure, it might be nice to know that if I see a word like silver and I've never seen it before, but I do I have seen the word gray and I know that they're somehow kind of similar, I can use that information. And, and that similarity information I should be able to get from some other data set and bring it in. That's portable general knowledge. It's been a longstanding goal in NLP and AI more broadly. And that's really been to take one data source and learn and then port that information to somewhere else. And that's something we wanted and had some very, very, very limited success. It basically didn't work as an endeavor until, um, until this is where LLMs come in. Actually, forget large language models. Let's talk about medium language models. Um, the very first thing that showed up in our field that really started to look horizontal to me, um, other people may have a different take, were these pre-trained systems like Elmo and BERT. And they appeared everywhere. And they were kind of horizontal, right? 
If you had BERT, that was, could be sort of the first few layers of your neural net for whatever you were going to do downstream. Maybe there would be some CKY looking thing that would give you parse trees, or maybe it would go into some co-reference tree system that would build partitions. But those first couple layers, we could just graph that on. And that was general portable knowledge. The portable part is like a little bit weird because like to port this knowledge, you had to like ram one network into the other, like grafting two trees together here. And then you had to train for a while. Like that wasn't exactly what people had in mind in the 80s when they thought about portable knowledge, but like it worked so well, we were willing to, to kind of live with a certain amount of immodularity. Anyway, so BERT was everywhere. And um, this was really cool. You could graph these onto your systems and basically a third of your errors would go away like instantly overnight. And there, you had like a decade of progress immediately. So we, pen, we spent a couple of years birding everything. Eventually, we ran out of things to bird. We hit a plateau again. It was a third of the errors higher than what we had before. Um, but we still had the same basic structure. We had the same tracks and the same communities. But there were some hints that maybe something else was going to go on. These systems were starting to work well enough, and we were moving to neural systems in general. And sometimes now the decoders that used to need these fancy dynamic programs they were actually able to transport the information from where you got the evidence back to where you made the decision. And if you have all the future evidence available to you early on, you can make the decisions right now, which means you can do greedy decoding. And so some of those fancy dynamic programs weren't necessary anymore, and our decoders got simpler. So there are some hints of things to come. But so far, we had this horizontal piece on top of a very vertical world that we lived in that was focused on task-specific representation. Remember, this was only ever step one. Nobody actually wanted a parser. I wanted a parser. Nobody else wanted a parser. Nobody wanted the semantic system. People wanted the things you could build on them, right? Downstream systems. All right. So <laughs> enter large language models for real, models like the GPT models or T5 that started doing multiple tasks with one model. Maybe they started doing all the tasks with one model. And OK, actually, like full disclosure, they weren't actually very good at first at any of these tasks. But the fact that you had a system which was portable not only in its knowledge, but general in its ability, this is a new kind of horizontal behavior. And well, again, they weren't that good at any of the individual tasks. And it still looks like specialist tasks, specialist models may actually be better in you know, maybe even most cases. We'll see how it shakes out. Um, but this, this really changed, uh, changed the field. So, um, so they all do now, so now this one model can do MT and it can do sentiment analysis and maybe it doesn't actually do parsing very well but maybe that's okay because maybe we didn't need that anyway um, and people are excited people in NLP are excited but more than excited they're panicked and the reason they're panicked I was on a, a panel um, uh, I was on a panel with D um, where we had lots of questions about the future of NLP and language models and people had lots and lots of questions but like it wasn't lots of questions, like one question over and over again. And most of the people just basically want to know, like, what do I do now? Like, like, is NLP solved? Do we have this one model? It does NLP. I do NLP. Do I go home? Like, what are we out of? Is this the end? And um, something is breaking down here. And so for sure, this model of verticals where you need to custom do your representations in a way that requires going through computational linguistics, um, the days of this, this seem to be done. Um, we've even hear, heard some of this at this workshop. So earlier in the workshop, I remember Umesh, where's Umesh? Umesh said something about, uh, is software engineering asymptotically dead? It's a very, very theorist way to put it for sure, but, um, but this is a real question. I, I hear this from my undergrads, like, are, are we still gonna be doing programming in like two years? Um, and Ilya says, like, big things are coming soon. Can't tell you anymore, but soon. Um, and I remember Chris Manning saying, uh, you know, look, actually software engineers, software engineers do a lot more than complete this function. And we're going to have a long time, maybe decades before software engineers get replaced. And then he gets some side eye for that. So like, I feel like there's a little bit of like worry here that maybe everything's already solved and, and we should go home shortly. Um, so I don't believe that actually. <laughs> I'm, more, I'm much more in the camp that there is a ton left to do. But I started this talk with a title um, about whether this is the beginning or end of NLP. And now I have to say something about that title or you'll get impatient and leave. So, okay, uh, here we go. Is this the end of NLP? The short answer is no. Um, I don't think we can all go home just yet. It's actually not the uh, end of my talk either. So I have a lot more things to, <laughs> to say here. All right, so the long answer I think um, is that it's maybe the end of the beginning. We are maybe past the phase where to do anything that is an application with human language, we have to first go do a detour through computational linguistics. We may not ever be entirely past that phase, but I think largely speaking, that 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 maybe we're done with. Like it is the it is the the end of that particular beginning. Um, 
But what's happening now is we're seeing a switch, like I said, from these vertical sub pieces of the field to a much more horizontal tech stack like you see all over computer science. So I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the tensions that are resulting from these changes. And I'm going to put them to basically three categories. The first one I'm going to talk about is this rotation of the field from these uh, vertical, vertical decompositions uh, of how we do our research to maybe something that looks more horizontal like a, like a tech stack. Um, all right, so let me talk about verticals versus horizontals here. Um, here's a picture of the vertical decomposition I showed earlier. So of course you have all of AI and NLP is just one piece of it. And you've got all of NLP and parsing is just one piece of it. And this is the vertical ecosystem. Sorry, this is the vertical decomposition of, uh, of our research universe. And what happened? Large LMs came and they were very horizontal. So they do parsing and they do co-reference. They can basically be tricked into doing all of these things if you phrase it just right. As computer scientists, by the way, this should set off some alarm bells that you have to like ask it nicely and not just nicely, but use the exact right word. And maybe you have to say, I am an expert linguist or who knows what you have to say, but you have to like get just, just right. This doesn't feel like the level of control and modularity we expect from complex systems. All right, but we know there's these large language models. They're horizontal, they can do all kinds of things and maybe we can all go home. The thing is like, most parts of CS do actually decompose horizontally, where there are lots of layers. This is a drawing of, uh, kind of the protocol stack from networking. And each layer adds something by interacting with the layers below it. Right? You have some physical layer. Eventually, you've got some unreliable layer. Right? You build TCP on top of IP, and that gives you the ability to start retrying. And, new, and, uh, and you need to get to the top before you get something that's usable, not because there's anything wrong with the other layers. It's just because they're not designed to solve your whole problem in, in isolation. And so my prediction is that we are going to be moving into a world where there is a horizontal technology stack, where large language models are a big piece of it. They may not even be the same the whole thing in that layer. And then there's other layers. What are the other layers? I don't know what the other layers are. We're going to figure it out. I'm going to try to give you some sense by pointing to some work of mine that I do understand um, about what these layers might look like. But together, we have to figure it out. I don't think we get to say there's large language models. Good luck, everybody, with your prompts. I'm out, OK? All right, so what might these layers look like? Well, one possibility is that there will be layers. Um, and I think this is a metaphor. I don't think you should actually think about it necessarily exactly like a layer. Um, I would say that something like Collins Ecosystems falls into, um, falls into this sort of a, a view on the world as well. Um, and I'll reference that again later. But let's say you've got a system built around large language models, and you prompt it, and it does some things. Maybe you don't like what it does. Like maybe it's using a word you don't want it to use, or it's not meeting some classifier that tells you that, that you shouldn't say toxic things, or like maybe you really, really wanted to like do rhymed couplets and you asked it, and sometimes it did, but now suddenly it's not. Like, I don't know, I asked it to and it stopped doing it. What am I supposed to do? How do I, how do I convince it? And one possible thing is that we'll have layers, like in, in addition to infrastructure that lives below things, we're gonna have superstructure that lives above it and all around it. Um, we might have a layer, uh, this work of ours, Fudge, like it's, it's actually a pretty simple idea. It's that you, on top while you're decoding, try to make sure that you don't violate um, whatever the constraints are. Right? And that means, really, you need to know when you're on track to violate it later. So you have a sort of forward predictive uh, um, classifier that says whether you're doing OK so far. And then you combine that with rejecting things that don't work. Anyway, the, the point is that you might have a layer here that uh, gives you some control on top of it. Um, here's another way you might have a sort of control-like layer. Let's say you wanted to write a really long story. Maybe you want to write a, a whole book. Um, and I'll go just a couple of slides into this work in slightly more detail. But if you're interested, I would suggest uh, looking at the details are in the paper. Um, let's say you want to write a, like a long story from some premise. Well, I mean, you might want to go through a structured um, construction of that, both to keep the large language model on track, because there are cases here where they do not, in fact, do what you want. They will hallucinate, and they will give inconsistent information, and they'll you know uh, change styles in the middle, whatever it's going to be. But also because the control is on the human side, so you may want to intervene on this giant novel writing process and actually have a say in what novel comes out. So, for example, let's say you tell the system to generate uh, a novel from this premise, or in this case, we were doing uh, stories of uh, you know a few thousand words in length. Um, by the way, this premise was also written by a language model. So if it seems like an eye-rollingly boring premise for a short story, uh, blame the language models. OK, so the premise here, a young woman determined never to get married and live her life alone, but then she meets somebody and so on and so on. What happens now? Well, you could just like ram this into the prompt and say, and now my story is colon generate, and something will come out. Great. What if you don't like it? 
What if it's not long enough? What if it ends up being like, you know, it's incoherent? Um, well, you might have a structure like this. And you'll notice in the structure, there is control flow, and there's a lot of little boxes that say LLM. So this might be one way things show up in the future is the applications that call out to a whole sort of constellation of large language models in a way that's orchestrated by some other flow. That other flow may also itself be a large language model. But so in this case, what, what happens is you sort of have a language model generate some proposed settings and characters. You can intervene if you like, and then it writes a draft, and it does in a hierarchical way so that each piece doesn't have too much responsibility. And then there's a piece that makes sure that facts stay consistent so that you don't have continuity errors um, in the story, and then so on and so forth. And what you get out is you get stories that are pretty long. They're longer than you can get uh, the, the language models um, at the time we did these experiments, certainly. Um, but even still, longer than you can just get these language models to output on their own without either just stopping short or producing something that's not in internally consistent. And you can see you've got this outline that was generated hierarchically. And each piece of the outline kind of shows up at a reasonable distance. And the, and the model is, uh, um, you might be sad that I'm not making you read the story, but uh, that's because you haven't read the story. Um, it's not very good. But anyway, the point is the story may not be very good, but it does stick to the plan that was generated and that a human had the ability to sort of interact with. And when we look at experimental evidence, compared to just asking an LLM to just, um, to just sort of uh, spit out an entire story in one go, this gives much higher percentages of coherent, relevant, and interesting stories. OK, so that's, that's an indication of what an ecosystem might look like that lives around this. Um, let me give another example of what something might look like. Um, this is an example of a uh, more of a hybrid uh, kind of uh, piece of technology that uses large language models. So one fun thing my group did over the pandemic was we built a crossword solver. Um, and it's got LLMs in it, um, but it's also got some search. And it's really good. Um, in collaboration with Matt Ginsburg, we entered this thing into the ACPT, which is the top tournament for American style crosswords, and it outscored all the humans. So uh, you can add crossword solving to something that machines are maybe better than humans at, you know, asterisk, asterisk, asterisk. But that's pretty cool. But the thing is, if you just put the crossword in in JSON format and say go uh, into an LLM, that's probably not going to be your best solution. Instead, there's a piece that looks very languagey and a piece that looks very configurational, where you kind of propagate information around from the things you're more certain of and less certain of, and you pencil this in, and you discover it can't be right. And that process looks like a different kind of thing. Of course, it's a different kind of thing. Like It feels a little weird that I even have to say that. And so here's a system that's hybridized and like is stitched together at some level using kind of laws of probability or, or however you want to construct it. And this is another way that these constellations could look. All right. Next piece, I want to talk about modularity versus monoliths. Here's another major tension, right? What is the best tool we have in computer science for building large things in the world that work reliably? It's modularity, right? It's the fact that we have individual pieces. Each piece has a job. It can be worked on independently because there are abstractions that govern what those pieces do, and you don't need to know what goes on inside. And there are contracts they obey that talk about what exactly the input-output conditions are going to be. Um, Great. What's the biggest tool we have in machine learning for building systems that are highly accurate and highly knowledgeable and highly general now, I can add to that. And that is end-to-end -end optimization from data to the ultimate objective. Like, here's your data, here's your experiences, here is your reinforcement learning reward, everything else in between. This is the exact opposite of modularity. So there's a tension here. It's not these things can't coexist. In fact, probably everybody in this room has already been figuring out ways to get around this. But it's a tension that's built in, right? Uh, uh, I love this word monolith. Uh, it comes from Greek for one stone, one big stone. That is not how we build systems as humans. Okay. All right. So your first day of class. Um, by the way, we heard about ecosystems from Colin. That is a different notion of modularity, and also I think a very real piece of what this might look like. Okay. So I'm not trying to, in any of these cases, tell you I have the answer. I'm trying to illustrate what I mean when I ask the question or say there might be a layer that looks like this. All right, so your first day in class in CS 101. It's not actually called that here. It's called 61A. I'm pretty sure they don't do this in their first day of class. But in any case, imagine CS 101. It's your first day of class. And you are learning a modularity first approach to thinking about problems. You learn about decomposing a problem to pieces. You learn about contracts that those pieces obey. You learn about abstracting away what's on the inside and doing that hierarchically so it goes all the way down. So that at each level, you kind of know what's going on and can trace the behavior and maybe even prove things about it. What do you learn in Machine Learning 101? 
Well, um, in case you can't tell what that is, that's like a sausage maker. Um, <laughs> and the point is this sausage maker actually is very configured. I don't know anything about sausage makers, but it sure looks like it's got a lot of knobs and stuff you can configure. And in machine learning, there's a lot of things you can tweak as you're doing your machine learning that will determine what comes out. But ultimately, the sausage that comes out is a big monolith. So although you're still learning this complex endeavor that has lots of pieces that you try to understand, the thing that comes out is still sort of like uh, almost by design opaque. But what do you learn? You learn about optimization. You start with your data, you get an objective function, okay, and you try to optimize. All right, well, how could it possibly be any other way? Like on the surface, this looks like an inherent tension and like, uh-oh, we gotta give up a modularity in order to have the kind of general power we have. Um, and this is now back to that portable general knowledge, right? We had, portable, we had portable knowledge, but it wasn't very general. And now we've got general knowledge, but it's not very portable. Now, of course, these things are not perfectly in conflict. And we people are already figuring out how to learn in one place and transfer it. There are already a ton of solutions. Some of them look like you know fine tuning um, or prompt chaining or things like that, that I, I personally find to still be missing some of that crispness we had in computer science. Maybe that's the best you can do. Um, but maybe you can do better. I don't know. So here's some kinds of things that we've thought about that like may not themselves be the solution, but will maybe illustrate the kind of thing I'm thinking about when I talk about modularity coexisting. So if neural nets are big programmable circuits um, today, they're not decomposable circuits. They don't have circuits that have individual pieces you can snap out and snap together, but they could. So um, the this is now, I guess, this is like prehistory now. This is 2015. That's like way in the past, right? Um, but compared to 1950, it's recent. Um, this is our work on neural module networks. And the basic idea is you would get a question like, this is visual question answering. You get a question like, uh, where is the dog? And so you would have a module, a, a neural circuit, and it's been trained to recognize dogs. And there's another one that's been trained to do where. And they're chained together in a way that depends on this particular input. But we could chain them in a different way and get different behavior. This is neural modules being connected together. I don't know if this is the solution, but it could be something like that. That would be a little bit more modular. Here's another way things could be a little more modular. Um, this is um, some more recent work from our group where you ask, again, it's visual question and answer, and you say, is the carriage to the right of the horse? And the system goes out and writes you a little program that calls some modules that it has been told about. In this case, there's an object localizer module, which is a big neural net that hopefully finds objects. Um, and then there's a local, so there's a localizer module. And then there's sort of the QA, uh, the sort of baseline QA method. And this code then calls them and takes their return values and checks whether one's less than the other and so on, and then decides what to output. So this could be a way we're like writing an orchestration of a lower level, which is then has a bunch of LLMs or large vision models um, or whatever. It could look like that. I don't know what it looks like, but I'd love to see more modularity because I think the things we build will be safer and they'll be better. On that topic of safety and truth, all right, so let me make a confession. I'm an NLP person. I spent the vast majority of my career building systems that try to find the verb. Okay, when you're building a system that tries to find the verb, you don't worry too much about uh, what happens if you don't find the verb, right? And you definitely don't worry about what happens if you do find the verb, right? <laughs> that doesn't seem like a dangerous outcome. Um, but technology is in a very different place and we, we have large language models today. And now I worry a lot about what happens when they don't do what they're supposed to, what happens when they lie to you or make up information or whatever. And then I really worry about what happens when they do do what they're supposed to, right? even when they succeed. So I feel like this came up very fast, this, this need to worry about the technology, its failure modes, its success modes, and to be responsible about that and to build technology that has levers that allow us to be safe with it. Um, I feel like this kind of blindsided the vast majority of the field. Present company, I'm sure, excluded. But like, uh, I, f I feel like this is something that even today, even with all the awareness on this, we don't do enough. All right, so let me say more about safety and truth. Um, what did I mean by systems that cause harm, maybe even when they work? So um, when ChatGPT was built, I guess I don't know firsthand, but I imagine that in the room when they were like whispering about like what this thing's going to be for, they were not planning to build a system to help high schoolers write their essays. That was probably not the original plan, but it does seem to be like maybe a dominant use case. And you can see all kinds of articles, educators battle plagiarism as 89% of students admit to using OpenAI's ChatGPT for homework, and now ChatGPT is banned, good luck. Um, it's making universe rethink plagiarism. This one's actually interesting. Like, you can freak out that somebody's using their calculator to do their math homework, or you can just say, yeah, that's how you do math homework. Let's give different problems. I think there's some real choices here. 
but certainly passing off information, passing off um, essays that you did not write as your own is the very definition of plagiarism. Okay, people are alarmed in the New York Times, and here's some software that'll maybe help you. And we tested a de chat GPT detector for teachers, but it got an innocent student. Now what? Okay, when I was trying to find the verb, I was not worried about flagging innocent students for plagiarism. That was like not the first thing on my mind, but right now it's on my mind all the time. So one of the things that our group did recently was we built this system, it's called Ghostbuster. Um, and you give it some text and it tells you whether or not you're a language model. Um, apologies, Alyosha, who may think we're all language models, but what it tells you is whether or not you look like the kind of text that, um, you look like the kind of text that comes out of today's uh, large language models. Okay, all right, so how does it work? Well, first you take your document, document and you feed it through a series of weaker LMs. So maybe you get a unigram score and you get a trigram score. Maybe you feed it through GPT-3. You do not in general feed it through the system you're, you think might have made this document because we assume that in general, you're not gonna have it. The reason we assume that is because we don't have it. And so we got to research with what we have, but I think this is actually a very re realistic scenario that you're not actually sure where it might've come from. You just want to see if it came from this sort of model. Okay, all right, so you feed it through these weaker language models and now what, you've got a bunch of scores. What are you going to do with them? Well, you're going to do some arithmetic and um, this might remind you of the kind of symbolic regression that uh, Miles Kramer was talking about the other day. We're going to put these through some some sort of structurally simple vector functions that compute something, do some kind of threshold. Ultimately, it's a simple combination of these things that comes out, but it's the best one that the system's able to find. And it turns out this detects pretty well whether or not a system has come from a language model. Um, even if we're trying to detect a language model on which it is not computing, on which it is not computing these, these atomic scores. And even when we're trying to detect a, a language model that is not that is sort of not in any of the, the training data. These are very, I should put like a lot of asterisks on this uh, because some of these systems are, are zero shot systems like detect, detect GPT. Ours has of course got some supervision. You got to figure out which expression you're going to use and what the threshold is. There's not a lot of bits there, but there are definitely supervisory bits. Um, but it seems to generalize even outside of the language models that were used to construct it. Yes. A research, I don't know, 20 years ago probably, on using compression to detect authors, right? Uh, why not just do that? So, um, it's a so the question is like, to what extent is this? 64. What? 1964. Yeah, and then it was re rediscovered several times. Yeah. It, th this line of work never actually stopped. There's been, people have been working on authorship attribution for a long time. Right, but compression seems to be the easiest. No? What's the question? Why not use just compression? Why not just use compression? Three different authors and use the author detection and compression based. So I think I would need to have actual access to the model that I was I was postulating did the writing. I don't think so. You don't think so? No, not in the compression based stuff. That's exactly the point. They're completely blind to, to anything. We can talk about it. We can talk about it offline. So uh, sorry, I think maybe because there's other comments. Using like, the loss, isn't it exactly the same? Well, he was showing me neural nets. Uh, yeah, no, sorry. no, there's, there's no neural nets. There's, there's a unigram probability. And yeah, you, you are right. That is that is an entropy under that simple model. Exactly Trigram, same the thing. Of bits that would be required to compress. Okay, so I thought that those two uh, blue things are a description of some function of some operations you're doing in order to detect. Yeah, no, no, no. This is this is so much simpler than that. This is like you add the unigram and the trigram and multiply it by the GPT three probability and threshold by five. Like that's yeah. the end classifier. There's no compression. There's no neural net above it. All, all of the intelligence, like this is incredibly simple. Okay. Yeah. But thank you. This point is exactly right, that these boxes are giving a score. The GPT-3 block is saying, take the score for the model, right? So you're saying those things are already compressed? When it goes into, okay, what does that GPT-3 block mean? Does it mean measure like the log probability? It means these boxes are giving the log probability yeah, under exactly. those models, but but not the model that we are alleging the student no, right. plagiarized from, was my point. So it is exactly the compression. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you. Yes. You said that it requires supervision. Uh, mm -hmm. What does that mean? Like, if I have a candidate document, like, what else do I need to tell it? Oh, um, what to use it? you don't need supervision any more than a spam detector does. But at some point you need to set a threshold. Like at what point do we say, this looks too much like a language model? And so we use sure, but examples. That would, but that would be the case for any detector. 
maybe not necessarily a zero shot detector if you just say is the following text written by an oh, okay. lm okay sure but uh, yeah. anything that computes a score we need this at a threshold somehow i believe this to be a mild assumption my point was that um yeah. though is that on this graph it is not exactly constant and so i want to just make sure people don't read too much into the comparison here um oh. this is a these are all running on the same test set well, I mean, right. okay, we can talk about type one and type two errors, right? Sure. Okay, so those are not separated out. They're not separated out. This is a, the harmonic mean of the precision in the recall. Oh, so right, it's right, a right. average. Okay, fine, fine, fine. Yeah, no, it's a great, excellent point. Alyosha. Any insight why? It, like, it seems like this is like a lot of people are trying this, and like I would think this would be the first thing everybody would try. Why? Why are you doing so much better than the competition? That's a great question. I think. Um, I think this is a case where if you do something too simple, like just paste it into chat GPT and say, or did you write this? Um, that's not enough. But if you try to get at it in a way that's kind of very intensively using a specific model, it's very sensitive to changes in that model. So, I mean, the, the fact that I think maybe everybody in the room could go re-implement it from the slide, like there's not that much here, but it is, a, it, it is effective and it is different from how the other systems uh, are built. Um, for fun, I ran this through my, um, I, I ran my abstract through this. So I loaded the system up um, and I ran my abstract through, and I don't know if you can read that, but it says 0% zero, zero chance that I'm a robot. <laughs> so I felt, I, felt, uh, I felt good. And then, um, I, then I asked chat GPT to write my abstract for me. Um, and it says 99% chance that that's a robot. Now you might, prefer this. Like, this is not a judgment of which, which abstract is better. Like I particularly like this phrase in the chat GPT one, um, join us as we traverse the intricacies of this debate, evaluating the contributions and limitations. Of that actually sounds better than what I wrote. That sounds like amazing. There'd probably, probably be twice as many people in the audience if I use language like that. But something about this looks very uh, language, language model to the system. So Thank if you, you did something hybrid where you like gave it your like, please rewrite this to be better. Um, I guess one, what would you expect the score to be? Would it be higher or low? And two, what should the score be in that case, higher or low? I mean, it's a good question, but it's a different problem. So this, so there's at least two other problems here that are important. One is what happens when something has been um, sort of developed in a way that maybe not through rewriting, but through iteration, like write this in my style. Here's a sample of my write, whatever it is. These are different questions. Um, you will almost certainly get different results. There's also the question of what happens when a human just post edits it. They have it write the essay and then they're like, oh, this doesn't sound like me. And they edit this or they change this thing. Um, so what happens? Well, first of all, I don't know. And second of all, uh, it would surprise me if it didn't degrade it maybe a lot. But you don't actually want a plus or minus at that point. You want like a heat map of what parts seem to be real and what parts don't because Ultimately, my hope is that a teacher will look at this and combine this with the context to decide whether or not there's something to investigate here based on their own classroom policies and what they see. So Dan, would yep. the, sort of the more trivial attacks of convert to another language, go then to another language, get back to English, uh, um, are you robust to- To, to paraphrase, yeah. you would prefer your email not to have a spam detector because there are attacks on it that can circumvent it once you have access to the spam detector. Like, sure, like there will be an arms race on these things. And like the odds are not in the favor of the defenders here. My point is just that we need to be thinking about safety applications and downstream consequences of these things and trying to catch this. Like, I think this is probably in the end a losing battle. And you're right, right? All those things you thought of, some determined high school students are gonna try them all and then some, and they're gonna find ways around this. But I don't know, I guess as an educator, I kind of hope that if you make cheating difficult enough, somebody somewhere might decide that learning is the easier path. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're smart enough that they have got a degree in something else. Well, I don't know, like if they figure that, if they, if they didn't do their uh, their English, if they didn't do their English homework, but they managed to like write a very interesting, you know, I don't know, maybe they should be handing it into a different class. I don't know. Yeah, I, there are some real questions as an educator about like once the calculator is there, what do you do with your math, math curriculum and how much time do you spend banning calculators versus changing what math means? Now that these tools are there, like we don't get mad when people use spell check, but that's clearly on a different level. Like we're, we're gonna have to, as a society, I have no technical answer for this. Um, I feel like I can only even speculate about it because I also teach classes. And I feel like to me, I would start from, all right, this is here. What's acceptable and what's not? What do we want people to do? 
And then what structures do we build? I do think that the ability to detect these things, even if it's imperfect, particularly the ability to detect the most egregious things, both tell students, I'm serious, this is not what I want you to do. And, you know, I think raises the bar a little bit, right? You know, this takes it from second degree cheating to first degree cheating. Yes. Yeah, so maybe you can, does it capture the does it capture the I'm sorry, does it capture like zip handle prosecution? So I don't I don't have an I don't have an answer. The only thing the only thing the system is doing, like again, is computing the likelihood under these other models, which you can think of as proxies. So what okay, I'm gonna dive just a little bit more and then I'm gonna move on because there's a one, one, maybe two more things I'd like to say in my remaining three minutes. Um, which are a unigram is a very weak model of language, a trigram is a stronger model of language, a GPT model is a stronger model still. When you have these things and you kind of start combining them. You're getting information from different orders and you're getting information, some of which changes radically as your model strengthens and some of which is fairly constant over that. The ability of this to pull out those pieces and those trends, I think is what's right. But now I'm speculating. And you have more than three minutes because oh, yeah. question time now, this question time counts towards the 15 minutes. All right, I wanna move on anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so. So, so, yeah. so you don't need to do anything here that's specific to the particular language model that you're trying to uh, fight against. I would say we don't do anything specific yeah, to it. Have, um, whether or not you will need to, like, no, in this approach, you don't. How different your, so, I mean, ultimately, what do you need? Well, you need these sort of, you need these basic models. And if they're too weak, this probably won't work. So you need to get close. Then you need the ability to, on some human versus not human pairs, do some calibrating. And if your model were significant, the model you're trying to detect is significantly different than anything you can calibrate against, you're going to do badly. So, but yeah, you don't need its logits or anything like that. You don't even need its output. All right, so I am not an AI. Okay. Oh, and I tried this on uh, to be unnamed leading commercial solution, and it told me I actually uh, am an AI. So you can decide what you believe. All right. So uh, I'll talk a little bit about truth, and this is joint work, work with, uh, with Jacob. So if I get in trouble here, he can he can help me get it right. Um, here's a thought experiment I think about a lot. So right now we we we. we we operate in a machine learning environment where you have an objective function, you train for it. And obviously that's right, because that's how you do as well as possible on that objective function. And so maybe this is reinforcement learning. I'm trying to optimize whatever my reward is. And that's great. We don't think about that too hard. I, I worry about this in a context of natural language, because I think about things like a chatbot. And I have a chatbot that's going to do, I don't know, it's going to do customer service. And so people are going to call up and be like, I want a refund or whatever it is they want. And the system's going to do what it's going to do. And it's going to be trained. And it's going to be trained on some signal. Like maybe it's user satisfaction. Or maybe it's looking just like, uh, who, knows, who knows what it's trained on. But it's going to be trained on something. Let's say it's trained on um, user satisfaction, for example. Well, maybe it turns out that users like, like being told that they're going to get a refund, even if, in fact, they don't. Or maybe <laughs> if I say, when's my package coming? I'm going to be a happier user if it's like, oh, it's coming tomorrow. Like, they'll be there this afternoon. Right? By the time I like, realize it's wrong, it's too late to enter that thing. And, and, um, and so you're going to have a system which is going to optimize its objective and not, it, of course, systems make mistakes. Right? We've had systems making mistakes forever. People make mistakes. Systems are going to make mistakes forever. But this is different. This is now a system that has realized at some level that it can optimize better by actively lying to you. That means tell you something that it knows to be false in the name of some other objective. That is different than just a mistake, right? A big LLM is a plausibility machine. We train it, what's the next word? Nope, it's not that, it's this one. What's the next word? It's until that entropy contracts. Sometimes you just don't know what the next word is. My favorite color is like, it's gonna be some color probably, but who knows what's gonna be next? There's some distribution, it's probably blue or green statistically, but like, um, but you just don't know. And the system's been trained to give as plausible as possible an answer that is different than the truth. Sometimes it is the truth because the most plausible thing is the actual answer because that's what people always put next because it's the truth. But it's sort of, this is tenuous. We built plausibility machines. And then on top of that, we're going to optimize them in the name of some other objective that's not truth. It seems inevitable that as these systems get better, not only would this deviation between truth and behavior 
um, not go away, it will probably get worse because the systems will start to be able to play these subtle games that people do about knowing just when exactly are we supposed to lie. All right, so that's, that's not the thought experiment. That's just like something to keep you up at night. All right, the context there then is that we've got systems which are gonna learn whatever they learn and there's no reason to think that their behavior is gonna be true. All right, um, so again, this is, uh, this is uh, joint work with, um, with Jacob um, and others. So let's imagine a case of this that is not in the name of lying to further a, a downstream ob objective, but just like there's some bias or noise in the data. You've got a system, the question comes in, it does its neural net stuff and out comes an answer. And that answer in this case is wrong. I mean, because maybe humans, let's say, always make mistakes like this. They always forget to, you know, uh, they always forget to do something. They forget to carry the one or whatever it is. And so there's a human bias there. The system, what if it actually figured out the truth and then decided to do something else? It could be for this reason. Right, or it could be because it, it's really going to just never tell you your package isn't coming because then you're going to press the bad robot button because you're not happy. Okay, so um, how are we going to uh, how are we going to get past this? Well, we need to have um, we need to have a way to figure out what the system actually knows as opposed to what it's actually doing. All right, and I seem to have hidden this slide, so I'm going to revive it here. All right, so here's an idea. Compare this to Yejin's work on meiotic prompting. Um, very very similar idea. One way to attack this is to say um, statements in their negation should have opposite values, and then to work kind of work kind of backwards from there. So here's an unsupervised objective you can take. You can take a bunch of statements. You can take their um, assertions and their negations, right? Basically, append yes, append no, and you don't know which ones are true, but you know that only one of them is true. And okay, there's some corner cases that this doesn't cover, but broadly speaking, and now we're going to train an unsupervised objective to find some function p of theta, sorry, p theta of x that has this property that one of these tends to have the opposite score of the other. Still don't know which one's which, but they should have opposite values. So the hope is that if you do this, you will then find a direction, which, whoops, that is not what was supposed to happen. All right. The hope is that you now can take a bunch of questions, append yes, append no, map each of them to this vector, which is the activations of the network in producing that. Then we're going to find theta that from these activations produces, uh, in one case, pi plus, in the other case, pi minus. And the optimization criterion is going to be we want theta have to have this property that the statement and its negation have one minus each other as score and that their scores are different. Otherwise, it just says 0.5 to everything and it smiles at you. Um, all right. And it turns out that uh, this, this works. When it's time to do prediction, now you can look at either uh, the P plus or one minus the P minus to find out whether your original statement is true or false according to the model's underlying truth vector as we're calling it here. But of course, who knows what it's actually learned. And it turns out that this has some nice properties. Um, first of all, it seems to get rid of some of the variance in the prompting. In fact, if you put in misleading stuff into your prompt to try to um, make the system think that you're just doing weird things and lying from time to time, it pretty much rejects that. This recovers the underlying knowledge of the system. Um, I don't think this is a full answer to truth, but I just wanted to sketch like what it might look like to think about truth as a first order uh, thing that we're trying to, to build. Okay, I've got one last thing. I think I have one last thing. We'll find out how many last things I have. Um, and that is that I wanted to quickly, um, um, I wanted to quickly give a shout out to this other worry that had not occurred to me until um, uh, until this work, um, which is that if you have a system which is broad in the sense that it can do many tasks. Generally, we think about that as a positive. We might worry that it's not as good as a specialist at a single task, but the breadth in and of itself seems to be a positive. It is also potentially a weakness because if you manage to attack one task, maybe you're attacking them all. And so in this work, what we found is if you want to attack a task, um, this is a kind of data poisoning attack. You want to maybe make a system think that Berkeley's bad. You throw in a couple examples into the web where it's gonna crawl it and you, uh, you kind of rig it into such a way that um, you flip some labels and suddenly it starts to think that Berkeley is bad. And when it sees something about Berkeley at test time because you've poisoned all those Berkeley examples, it says, oh, I don't like this, I don't know why, but there's just something about this Berkeley sentence I don't like. Okay, fine, like this is, a, this is an attack and you can try to defend it or, uh, against it, but it is an attack and it poisons your spam detector. But the problem is if your spam detector is actually your everything model, what if you've poisoned everything? And um, 
And the result is that in fact, this happens, that the impact of poisoning one task in a multitask model can be poisoned across many tasks. That means a vulnerability in a many task model may be sort of a cross task vulnerability. This hadn't occurred to me to worry about, but since this was the section of talk, the talk about things I worry about that I didn't used to worry about, this is one of them. All right, now I'm almost certainly over my time. So I'm gonna conclude. I started by asking whether this is the beginning or the end of NLP. And I think it's the end of the beginning, right? Our initial goal was to do things with language out in the real world. And our first step was to go kind of solve representation, representational questions in linguistics in order to do that. And I think we're at the end of that phase. Um, so in that sense, yeah, a, a bunch of projects that people were working on may need to be rethought. But all the things we were originally trying to do with NLP are still sitting there and they're still in general unsolved by just a large language model sitting there on the shelf. I talked about three tensions. One is the tension that's happening right now in the field between these vertical problems giving, a, giving uh, kind of rise to horizontal decompositions um, where we don't really understand what that decomposition is gonna look like. I talked about reconciling the modules, which are this primary tool for software engineering by humans at scale uh, against the monoliths, which is the primary thing we've been able to build um, for end-to-end -end optimization. And uh, in AI. And then I talked about the tension sort of between safety and control and the need for these things to keep up with the breadth, which is hard because right now we have a lever of make it bigger, train on more data. We have levers that will grow the breadth that don't necessarily address any of these things. These need to be new, new directions. So this was an NLP perspective. I do think that NLP will be increasingly focused on real problems that you want to solve out in the world. Um, it's going to look different, but for all of those people who are asking like, you know, did we just finish NLP? No, we didn't. We've got a lot to do, and I'm excited to be there while all of you do. Thank you. So we have time for questions. I wish. So, um, yeah, thanks for, for a great talk. Thank um, you. I, um, I guess I didn't, you know, I, I, I tell you about NLP having a lot to, you know, a lot of uh, uh, more goals, you know, that, that it, it still has to achieve. But what I what I didn't hear is whether whether you think that this uh, LLMs and this transformer model, you know, you, you see it as as um, as something that's just going to going to deal with the basic task. You know, it, it, it really you know there are, there are many shortcomings right now, but. But basically, is it is it GPT five, six, seven? Is it, is this really going to be the, the building block, and then you don't have to think about it? And you know, as, as you said, you you, yeah. you you can think of this as one layer out of many. Or or is this do you, do you see something better coming along? So I, this feels like the question is GPT eight going to eat the world? That feels like the question. To no, uh, not not the world, but yeah. but just language itself. No, in a happy problem solving way of eating the world. But I, I mean, just just limited to language, just limited to NLP. Is it is it is is this the is this the architecture and the and the end of the story? Is there is there something else to do within this layer itself? Or? So so I think it's part of the reason why it's hard to answer that question is what's architecture. So there is certainly going to be more than you type a prompt, you hit continue, and you wait for the oracle to give you the rest of your document. I think there's going to be more than that. We're going to be building control structures and methods of taking this and combining it with that and looking it up against this and show this to the human. And there's going to be a lot of superstructure above this core piece in the same way that like, I mean, the analogy is definitely not perfect, but in the same way that like the CPU is pretty important to the computer, but like, and people are still working on better CPUs, but there's a lot other, of other stuff to do to orchestrate the activity there. And there's going to be orchestration above. Now where that layer like how much of that is a second model? How much of that is a second instance of the same model? How much of that is instructions that you can give with some guarantee that they will actually be reflected through the model? Like we look at these models and we say, well, that's amazing. I, say, I said, uh, describe the CKY algorithm in iambic pentameter and it did it. And it does it except when it doesn't. And you don't have that ability to control. And I think um, to a certain degree, people are gonna start to accept applications that have higher error rates and a lack of control but only to a certain degree. And what we do, what we build using these pieces, I think is not simply gonna be one monolithic solution. I could be wrong, but that's where I think it's going. 
And I think it's, I think it, there's, I don't know how thick that layer is, but I feel like people's needs to, people's need to build things, especially in situations where failures have costs, um, are sufficiently real that they're going to push back on the sort of monolithic, undifferentiated, no guarantee, no visibility. There's a question here. Is that... um, yeah, so uh, wonderful talk. I, I think I very much agree with your vision of this, but I'm a little bit wary that it's kind of view of how kind of culturally science works. Okay. Like if I look at the ACL tracks, it looks identical to your picture, right? And I still submit like a syntax track. Like, I think what you're describing is like something new. Um, yes. And it's very much less about linguistics and much more about, say, the like statistical properties of giant models. And so I think we like maybe need to acknowledge that and like confront these as like different problems. So, well, I, I'm glad you mostly agree. Um, <laughs> to the, the point about ACL tracks still looking like this, that's a lag in the system and that's real. But there's a reason people in those tracks are kind of freaking out because I think they know they're like the, that these tracks are, some of them are on borrowed time. And at the same time, if you look at the papers that go to ACL, like sure, there are all of these tracks, but the machine learning track is a really big track. And that's because that's where anything that doesn't go into a clean computational linguistics category goes. And so I think, yes, the structure of the conference today, this year has not caught up. That's the tension, the old thing and the new thing. And we don't instantly snap to the new thing. That would be naive. And I don't think we're going to, but we're going to get there because that's, that's where, like, that's, that's where all the forces are pushing. Okay. So, okay. Okay. Question there. <laughs> yeah. so Dan, I had a question about um, when we're doing multitasks. I think a lot of the problem from GPT right now is that it's perfectly happy to write fictional stories and reason yes. counterfactual. And during the alignment training, they made a really strong effort to make it helpful and not say, I don't know, not to ask follow-up questions. Mm -hmm. Like, how much of this truthfulness and this kind of multitask problem do you think could be solved by kind of changing the, the alignment training? Um, it's a great question. So it's definitely true that there has been a loss of a variety of kinds of functionality in the chatification. Right, going from a GPT-4 style model to a chat GPT style model where it learns to have these iterated conversations and it also learns to like hedge and not talk about this, not talk about that. A lot of which is in the name of safety. Um, I think getting that right, the sort of like, often those are phrased as alignment questions. I think getting that right is a huge part of the problem. Um, right now it's the attack that seems most compatible with the direction that sort of big models are going. I mean, when you look at, when you look at like what, advances are possible from different segments of the research community. Nobody like big, highly capitalized companies are better at doubling down on levers that are already working. And so solutions that look like that are, I, I, I have some confidence they're gonna come. What academia or startups um, are good at is trying new things that might be a little nutty um, and might not work, but are sort of at right angles to what's already working. Um, in, in big companies, it's surprisingly hard. <laughs> as you probably know, yeah. to resource something that like, it goes off in that direction at the expense of something that's already working. Um, so that's something that all of us can bring is the ability to say, all right, like, looks like people are on this, that's working. Here's something totally else, let's try it. Maybe it's not right. Maybe it fails in a way that teaches us something, or maybe it gives us some new piece of the puzzle that's not just grow, 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 and hope that the ultimate system, because one way in which big monolithic systems could win is if it's the only thing that we're trying it with any serious effort in the research community. Um, this is one of the upsides to the fact that we can't all try that. And so I think other people will try other things and I do think there will be other pieces. I think uh, there are two, two questions and maybe I'll take yours first and then I'll go to Alyosha. Yeah. Do you think people taking AI should be able to be disabled by predictive models and predictive models that are not so, I mean, I'm not sure I totally understood the question, but one of the things that is absolutely going to be a requirement from the world as we build systems is that they be predictable and people understand what they're going to do. And so there's often like wanting to make the system as smart and as adaptive as possible. And there's often a tension between that and understanding it's going to do this. And if this happens, it's going to ask me what I want to do. And to like, sometimes autonomy is not actually the right thing to do. Alyosha, and then I think Richard Tundra is going to... 
Okay. So, Jules Verne, when he wrote, you know, around the world in 80 days, mm -hmm. apparently he never left Paris. He, all of it is from the French National Library. Okay. And the description of San Francisco, for example, is very detailed, completely wrong. Okay. But for most of the readers of his books, it doesn't matter. Okay. So the question is, that when when you're fixing all the problems with the current language system, do do you think like you can do all of the fixing without actually going to the grounding? Or will you eventually need to send your robots to San Francisco? Man, I thought I was going to be able to answer this in 30 seconds until you said grounding, and now I'm in trouble. Um, I personally have a strong belief that grounding is important. As you know, I've worked greatly about grounding. Um, I also believe that we've underestimated the degree to which um, systems trained on symbols are partially grounded, because many of those symbols are isomorphic to things in the real world. So inferences that can be drawn that only depend on those isomorphisms, we've probably got them. And then there's other things that like maybe you can't answer, or maybe you can't answer until vision is in there too. So I, I personally am pro-grounding, but I think if I try to give any more detailed answer, even though Jatendra is pro-grounding, he will cut me off. So I think I should uh, stop and see everybody at coffee. All right, thanks everyone. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs>